What are your memories of WWE in the year 1991? There's a good chance that you were young enough to remember it fondly, since you were likely young, naive, and basking in the glow of the spectacle of it all. But you might not recall the sheer extent with which the WWF went heavy heat mad in one of its most controversial years ever. So I'm Gareth, this is What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 things you didn't know about WWE in 1991. Number 10, a sign of the times, an omen for the future. You might have wondered on more than one occasion why WrestleMania 8 was not headlined by Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair. It felt like the biggest match not just in the WWF but in all of pro wrestling. Hogan and Flair were the respective aces of the WWF and the NWA. In a trivia note, Hogan and Flair actually worked their first match unadvertised on an impromptu basis. In Dayton, Ohio on October 22nd, Hogan replaced Roddy Piper. Hogan and Flair did the post-TV taping dart match on a whim, thinking it was a good idea idea to feel one another out in the ring before taking their show on the road. You may have read that the program didn't, for whatever reason, connect with the public to the level anticipated, but you might be surprised at how early the thing failed to ignite. The very first advertised Hogan vs. Flair match took place on October 25th, 1991 at the Oakland Coliseum. Their main event drew 13,400 people, but did not set a record for pro wrestling nor sell out the building's capacity. So with that in mind, I've got a quick question for you. What is a match that you feel should have gone down on the grandest stage of them all? Let me know in the comment section down below. Number 9. WWE experimented with attitude much earlier than you thought. In December 1997, Vince McMahon ushered in the era of attitude, and for the next three and a half years or so, the WWF was swarming with exposed skin and misogyny. Incredibly though, given that the WWF of 1991 was a parody of the American hero's quest for justice, a premonition of attitude unfolded on the house show circuit between the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. As the Ultimate Warrior vs. Sergeant Slaughter series was prolonged, to send the crowd home happy, Warrior lost, but fans were granted catharsis when Sensational Sherry was hung upside down from a steel cage, exposing her bra and panties. As a side note, Dave Meltzer attended one such show and reported that, while the lads loved it, horrified parents dragged their kids home immediately. Number 8. Something for Bret Hart to smile about To fast forward to 1993 briefly, Yokozuna went over WWF champion Bret Hart in the main event of WrestleMania 9. The terrible finish Mr. Fuji threw salt in Bret's eyes acted as pretext for the controversial impromptu main event, in which Yoko was immediately dethroned by Hulk Hogan of course. The decision was made to revert to the easy shortcut that was Hulk Hogan because, while his act was a bit tired, he was a bigger name than Bret. The thing is, Bret had replaced Hogan for a good reason. The fire had gone out, and Hogan's box office magic had waned. It was a desperately upsetting night for Hart, but as disastrous as WrestleMania 9 was in general, it actually outdrew the night that Hogan became passe. WrestleMania 7 drew 400,000 buys on pay per view, with the medium well established by that point. Mania 5 drew a staggering 767,000, where WrestleMania 9 drew 430,000, but that incidentally was up 40,000 on the number Hogan drew for his main event against Sid Justice at WrestleMania 8 in 1992. This is not to state that Bret was a bigger draw overall than Hogan, but fans were more interested in seeing Bret reclaim his title than they were in the death rattle of Hulkamania. Number 7. It's not just AEW. Recently, WWE announced the Bash in Berlin premium live events for August 2024. Now, WWE has frequently promoted PLEs in international markets under Triple H and Nick Khan, and have a strong base of fans in Germany, but it would be naive to state that the timing of the show didn't have a tiny bit to do with the fact that German fans now have less incentive to travel to England to watch another major events promoted by a US company that does not tour Europe frequently. WWE has done this sort of things decades before All Elite Wrestling and All In 2 existed though. They were doing it long before 1991, but in 1991, Vince McMahon booked a stadium show out of pure spite. Because the promoter of the St. Louis Arena had allowed WCW to run shows in the building, and a gas Vince McMahon decided to book Bush Stadium in retaliation. Knowing that the attendance would dwarf the crowd WCW would pull to the arena, he and this was a ballsy move mere months after WrestleMania 7 was downsized, also knew that the arena promoter would see the WWF as the only viable wrestling racket in subsequent years. It's this sort of cynical yet astute thinking with which Vince got to where he was. Number 6. WWF equals bigger than Madonna In a sobering parallel between AEW in 2023 and the WWF of 1992, each promotion drew an enormous crowd to Wembley Stadium as domestic business softened. The first trend actually 
started a year prior, which compelled Vince McMahon to run SummerSlam 1992 in London. In October, the WWF toured the United Kingdom and Europe to staggering, record-breaking effect. The WWF caught a blaze in Great Britain, much as it had in the States years prior through the rise of Sky Sports. The UK equivalent to cable TV took longer to reshape the landscape, but eventually the WWF reaped the rewards for a second time. Kids in schools the land over annoyed their parents into forking out for an exorbitant subscription because the Fed was the talk of the playground. Vince McMahon and the Premier League drove Sky to households. The WWF occupied a bizarre transatlantic space between turmoil and triumph. Strange but incandescent, the WWF was so hot over here that a Wembley Arena show on October 14th sold out in just 56 minutes. At the time, this was the fastest sellout in the history of the building, breaking the record set by Madonna. That context is frankly insane. In 1991, Madonna was the talk of the tabloids, a figure of seismic controversy, and was touring the Immaculate Collection, the best-selling greatest hits album ever released by a solo artist. The WWF show was headlined by the Legion of Doom versus the Nasty Boys. Better than Madonna though, apparently. Number 5. WWF Brought the Heat 1990 was hardly a great year, but in 1991, it really felt like the walls were closing in on the 80s pop culture behemoth. In response to shock young fans back into caring, Vince decided to traumatize them. He booked a psyche scorcher of an angle in which Randy Savage was bitten in the arm by Jake Roberts' Cobra. It was heavily implied after an endless feeling administration of CPR that The Undertaker had suffocated the warrior to death by trapping him inside of a casket. As was taped in 1991, Marty Jannetty would rather have smashed his face into glass than confront the end of his friendship with Shawn Michaels. The WWF of 1991 was nightmarish for the young fans, as the bad vibes surrounding the promotion seemed to bleed through the camera lens. Number 4. The Real Reason Behind This Tuesday in Texas If you're a millennial fan raised on the WWF, cast your mind back to the early 1990s. When you sit down with your sausage and smiley faces dinner to watch Survivor Series 1991 on Coliseum Home Video. Life is good, but oh boy, The Undertaker is out next, and through your childhood lens, he's a real creepy. And oh no, he's just beaten Hulk Hogan for the belt. Blast! But Hulk Hogan might win it back at some show called This Tuesday in Texas? What the hell is this Tuesday in Texas, son, your dad asks? It's another 20 quid at Woolworths, that's what it is. Not a chance. Vince McMahon annoyed parents and left kids wanting, undermining the home video and pay-per-view markets with this cheap carny trick. Survivor Series and this Tuesday in Texas were two of the worst performing WWF pay-per-views in years, and really only existed as a double header to offset the startup costs of the World Bodybuilding Federation. Number 3. Him? Sergeant Slaughter to huge controversy was repackaged as an Iraqi sympathizer in 1991. The idea was to whip up a patriotic fervor amongst the public. He would get behind Hulk Hogan in huge numbers as he restored justice. The theme of the match was a total farce, almost kitsch looking back on it now, but it was somehow almost worse. Bruce Pritchard claimed on his Something to Wrestle pod that Tugboat was discussed internally to play the role of American turncoats and work Hogan in the main events of WrestleMania 7. Better yet, though this must have been a rib. Bruce contended that he would be named Sheik Tugboat. How? How was that going to be the name? An anthropomorphic boat that hated America nearly headlined WrestleMania. Number two, it was actually class. The WWF was rightly savage for exploiting the Gulf War as the key selling point of WrestleMania 7, and Karma gave them the old 10 punches on the top turnbuckle. The thing is, the period between the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania was actually strong, ignoring all that. And since hundreds of horrific world events have unfolded since 1991, a dim, calloused memory, it's a lot easier to watch it all in retrospect. Randy Savage entered an incredible heel performance at the Rumble, which in collaboration with Pat Patterson's superb knack of booking finishes, linked together the two main attractions at Mania 7 brilliantly. Savage almost tripped over Warrior. He was so intense and desperate to mess him up, and he absolutely nailed him with a scepter shot to hand Sergeant Slaughter the title. This set up both Slaughter versus Hogan, which was serviceable, a bit long, but very, very loud, and Savage versus Warrior. Hefty, unique, super dramatic, and indelible spectacle in and of itself, and a backdrop to one of the most moving angles in wrestling history. WrestleMania 7 in general was the best mania up till that point, and wasn't bettered until 10? The Jake Roberts vs. Rick Martel blindfold match was as silly as it was deafening, and in the Rockers vs. Haku and the Barbarian, and Heart Foundation vs. Nasty Boys, the WWF delivered what was then the best pair of tags in mania history. The former was a dynamic spot of escapology on the part of Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, where the latter was a blinding way of getting heat on the heels. 
Number 1. The Dave Meltzer vs WWF Blow Up In 1991, the year of war in the WWF, a battle broke out between the promotion and Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. A letter was written to Dave's then editor concerning a story Meltzer had written. Meltzer reported that Hulk Hogan was sent by the WWF to visit troops in Saudi Arabia in a bit to strengthen his public image, before the tour was throttled by the US Defense Department. The WWF vehemently denied that, claiming it was all at the behest of the USO. In response, Meltzer noted that somebody within the WWF had told him, prior to the letter being sent, that WrestleMania 7 was set to be the biggest ever. Sergeant Slaughter was set to burn the flag, which would position Hogan as the ultimate babyface patriot. And as part of the push to build interest in the event, Meltzer was told Hogan was going to Saudi. This sparked something of an existential crisis within Meltzer, who dedicated the entire February 4th Wrestling Observer newsletter to a treatise on journalistic ethics. In this issue, Dave revealed that he once worked for the WWF as a consultant on the Japanese scene. Tour dates, bookings, the way things played out in general, that kind of stuff. So if you believe that Dave shouldn't report on something he's never been involved in, you'd be wrong. The WWF made further accusations that Dave specialized in inaccurate, biased writing. The irony of which is that you can comb through virtually any edition of The Observer from 1991 and noticed that Meltzer was right on the money. And yet, in the September 30th issue, he correctly reported that the latest speculation is that they'll be asking Ultimate Warrior back. And he indeed returned months later. It was a bold one, given the events of SummerSlam 91, at which Warrior extorted Vince McMahon for Hulk Hogan money. That relationship was deemed dead. In the same issue, Meltzer reported that the Rockers had handed in their notice, but were unlikely to join WCW, since the promotion was not strong enough at the negotiating table. And what do you know, Dave was correct on both counts. It's almost like he knows his stuff. I've been Gareth from What Culture Wrestling. Cheers for checking out this video today. Hopefully we'll see you again soon, but in the meantime, just be good to yourself. Bye-bye!